All right, recording has started, and this is the December 16th, 2021 uh, cross plane community meeting. Uh, so we can jump on in here. I don't think there's a ton of agenda today, uh, but we'll dive right on into it. So first thing to notice here is that for uh, V1.6, which is the scheduled uh, upcoming next release of Crossplane, is that we did make a decision to uh, postpone that until after the holidays. Uh, the regularly scheduled release was for sometime next week um, when there will be a lot of folks in the community just not around uh, for a kind of a holiday quiet period there. So um, you know, we're encouraging folks to take time away, take time off, uh, be with families and re regroup, et cetera, or whatever you need um, you know, for, for your own personal choices. And so we will pick up the release again, uh, first thing uh, into the new year. So on Tuesday, January 4th, uh, we will be running that release. The 1.6 release branch has already been created. And so uh, you know, it is in a code freeze state there. Um, where we won't be taking new features, functionality, or complicated changes, but critical bug fixes and maybe some documentation fixes and things like that are still on the table for the 1.6 branch. Um, so that means that the main branch is open for changes working towards uh, 1.7. So main is open and ready to go, and uh, 1.6 is uh, stabilizing and baking right now. Uh, so I added a few things. Uh, I noticed that we weren't doing a fantastic job of keeping the 1.6 uh, project board open. So I went through the commits uh, from, from the 1.6 branch and added in some of the fixes and features and functionality there. Um, one of the bi probably bigger things to call out there is a uh, the focus on performance uh, that Nick had been doing um, and, uh, and, and others as well for um, for crossplane in general and so that will be an ongoing theme but there there were definitely some uh performance enhancements and improvements uh that you'll be seeing for uh you know reconciliation and um and being able to uh you know speed up and parallelize uh, some of the operations there um i don't think that any of these issues uh are blocking uh we're we're you know provider like um Partitioning and sharding provider configs is definitely not included in 1.6. Uh, the proposal around the provider runtime interface, um, you know, that's not something that's shipping in 1.6. And I think the other ones here are small ones. Uh, this one's docs only. So I don't think that any of these will block the release. It'd be nice to get some of these docs fixes in, um, but I don't think that there's major things that I'm aware of that are still blocking the release. Um, anybody out there have big things to mention for 1.6, concerns, blockers, obstacles, uh, anything to call out here? All right, then it looks like we're, uh, we'll be just baking in the 1.6 branch then over the holidays. And um, yeah, we will uh, be working on that release first thing in the new year then. All right, let's, uh, let's take an opportunity here then to go ahead and uh, just bring up the roadmap then while we're at it. So I think in the in the new year here, um, I think that uh, we're going to be getting some focus uh, on some of these uh, pretty interesting features and functionality that will be uh, big enhancements for the project. So Hassan did some really good work on the uh, pluggable secret store, um, being able to use alternative uh, stores like Vault for for storing secrets and credentials with Crossplane. That design um, document is, I think, converging and getting pretty close to being ratified. Hassan, do you want to give us a quick update on, on where that is? Yeah, sure. Uh, so um, my, my current target is to get it merged uh, until end of year. So this is uh, what I'm like pushing for. Uh, and the good news is like yesterday, the PR is approved by Nick. Uh, there are only like a couple of nits that that I need to like fix, and I, I believe it will be merged very soon. Uh, and then we can just start the implementation part. Big shout out to Hassan. The uh, the major delay on this has been my review cycles, not Hassan in any way. So uh, definitely looking forward to getting that merged and happy to merge it whenever you want. 
Yeah, that's great. I'm glad that the experience there has converged and people are feeling pretty good about it. Uh, and I think it, it's going to be uh, the feature itself is is quite powerful. Uh, but I think the experience around it is I'm happy where it's landing also. So yeah, great work on that for sure. Um, Nick, I think you, you might have joined while I was talking about some of the performance work. That's something that's kind of big on the roadmap also. Do you want to kind of give us an update about um, maybe what's in 1.6, but then also some of the future upcoming things that we'll be spending time on still with the uh, scalability and performance related stuff yeah so um swap that back into my mind so broadly the the most impactful performance changes were merged into crossplane core 1.6 uh and this a lot of it just has to do with uh, uh performance and fairness regarding how we uh queue uh reconciles in crossplane uh crossplane core now has um, a configurable amount of um, concurrency uh, so you can have it be reconciling more things at once if you would like to. The default and the sweet spot in my testing is uh, up to 10 things per controller at once. And that's tied also to the um, uh, number of reconciles per second that it will allow, which is a decent proxy in a lot of cases for uh, API calls that you're going to make to your uh, cloud provider. Let's say it's not exact, but it's a good proxy. Um, so. I believe my testing, which did involve having uh, the scalability changes, uh, the, the first pass of scalability changes uh, in both Crossplane and the providers it was orchestrating, um, brought down in some cases time for 100, a burst of 100 resources to become ready for 100 composite resources, fairly complex composite resources, composing like three managed resources, writing secret, a lot of rights to the Kubernetes API took the time for them to be ready off the top of my head, I want to say from something like 18 minutes to like 30 seconds or something like that for a, for a burst of a hundred, oh no, sorry, for three, for a burst of a hundred, about three minutes for them all to become ready. Uh, and scales up to like bursts of a thousand. So you can have like 10,000 things in the API server being reconciled fairly, fairly easily. Now uh, it just gets like a little bit slower, but nothing too unmanageable. Um, the, the, Big delay here, honestly, is that all providers need to be updated with the same updates. Uh, I'm probably personally not going to do literally every single provider, but I would like to get the generated providers updated, the big three, AWS, Google, uh, and Azure, and just rolling those out is just a very laborious, labor-intensive manual process. So I kind of have draft PRs open for all those that I'm going to keep chipping away at in the, uh, in the new year. Hey, Nick, and then something I think I might have missed in that was, um, so, you know, the, some of the, like, uh, you know, max reconciles or, or whatever the, the field was, is exposed now. Does, do, to, in order to take advantage of the performance benefits, do folks have to explicitly set a configuration value or is it, you know, do nothing and you get the benefits uh, without having to do anything explicitly? There's, there should definitely be an improvement versus 1.5 with the defaults. Uh, okay. So, yeah, okay. it is exposed as a knob. Uh, and I did some testing and uh, as I say, like the, the best value for that knob, uh, which actually could, it's exposed as like how many reconciles per second do you want? But if we actually fan that out to a lot of other things, like how much client side rate limiting do we do? Um, uh, what concurrency is allowed? And also how many reconciles per second do you want? We also wrote a uh, unusual controller runtime pattern for reconciling because the default rate limiting on Reconciles and controller runtime doesn't actually reconcile. It doesn't actually rate limit every reconcile. It rate limits only every, only certain cases. Anyway, we tested uh, anything from one to a hundred on that knob, I think, and ten seemed to be the sweet spot. You don't really get a lot more performance in in my setup, you know, which wasn't extensive. I didn't get a lot of gains after ten, so I set it at ten. Awesome, Nick. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. And I think that that sounds like a really good balance, and it's uh, informed by the testing also. So that that sounds perfect. Yeah, but I uh, just expect it to be slow to, unless anyone wants to volunteer to help out. It's just me rolling these things out. Um, and it's it's like, it's updating every single controller and all of these things to have this pattern. So it's, it's probably not gonna happen super quickly, but I will chip away in my spare time for the for the providers. Nice, yeah, thanks for, for that note, Nick. And then um, uh, I think also there is a desire and uh, maybe per perhaps more priority as well from uh, community feedback and just general discussion we've seen in the ecosystem around Crossplane is uh, around custom compositions. Uh, so that may be something that um, I'm feeling a little bit more of a sense of prioritization or, or urgency for that one to you know drastically expand the 
uh, I guess, fu functionality and surface area uh, that, that uh, the, co the composition machinery is capable of. Um, so I think, uh, Nick, if, if you want to add another comment on that, uh, but maybe not nothing, maybe there's nothing beyond that, hey, we think that's a, a priority that we want to address in the, in the next year early. Yeah, I'm personally eager to work on it. I'm slightly guilty because I do want to get those performance uh, things out as well. I don't want to you know, start working on something big and new before finishing the old one. Um, I'm personally eager to uh, get a get a more of a fleshed out design on that out, and I'm personally going to have more bandwidth. Hopefully, we've, we've uh, hired some folks in Upbound, so I have a bit more focus. Uh, I can get back to some, some more work on Crossplay. Um, so I, I personally am thinking there's like an 80 plus percent chance that I'll start rolling on that in Q1, like basically is my first thing of Q1. Very cool. Uh, yeah, I think that'd have a lot of benefits. And then I'm also hearing uh, a lot of talk and discussion and feedback too of, uh, you know, better integration with Argo, uh, where, you know, there are like conflicts between ownership or, you know, status, et cetera, of, of how Argo is expected to see objects and how Crossplane treats them. Uh, that seems to be coming up more and more uh, recently within the community as well. Uh, so that's, it seems like something that priority on that would be pretty, might be useful also. Jared, should we add that? I, it's not on the list. Yeah, I didn't see it on the on the list here, and I didn't. Uh, yeah, if you if you want to go ahead and put it on roadmap, I think that's pretty that's warranted for sure for from my perspective. I know Victor might appreciate that as well. Yeah, with regards to folks to work on it, um, I personally have to say I really don't use Argo CD that much. No dislike for it or anything. I just haven't had much use to to use it myself. So. Definitely, um, if there's anyone out there who feels like they've got a strong understanding of Argo CD and a strong understanding of Crossplane and have worked on Crossplane before, then that would be an ideal candidate to, uh, to work on this. So I can add something. So for us, we are using very extensively um, Flux, and there's one open issue in Crossplane for case status that we, uh, so that Flux can check the status of all of the objects. Is this also something you want to focus on if you're looking for Argo? Um, you know, one thing that that does bring to mind is that uh, uh, effectively, yeah, part of the problem with Argo, I believe, is that it doesn't have any concept of, of like the case status. Uh, I believe, if I understand correctly, from uh, from the issue that was raised for um, uh, for Flux. There is this this whole case standard, standard uh, that I'm not sure how well adopted it is, but uh, it, uh, at the end of the day, it kind of boils down to if there's a ready status <laughs> and ready is true, we'll consider it true. And then there's some other more specific things that happen in front of that. But if they're not there, then if there's a ready status and ready is true, then it so gets to be ready. Um, there, are, there are actually two two issues, at least that I know of. One is the status you're mentioning, um, which I'm guessing is a smaller issue. The bigger one is that it uh, we cannot use claims with Argo CD. Yeah. Uh, so and, uh, now I'm curious. Uh, uh, whoever spoke before you, uh, you're using Flux. Did you are you using Flux with claims or compositions? I'm just trying to figure out whether it's the same problem we, affecting both. Yes, it's it's the same at the end because I know the guys from Essentia they're using uh, Argo. We're using Flux, and at the end we have the same problems under the hood. Okay. Can you guys, um, hi, sorry, I'm Matt. Uh, first time I'm joining the meeting here. Um, we use Argo heavily and we're just beginning to investigate Crossplane. Um, can someone describe the problem with the claims? Like I understand the status issue, like telling, figuring out how to tell Argo that a resource is, is ready or not. I get that one, but the other issue I'm, I'm unclear on. Yeah, so uh, my understanding, and I might be wrong, is that when you create a claim, uh, the claim creates um, uh, creates resources that are not children of that claim, and uh, but of the Argo CD application, uh, or Argo CD thinks that it's on the same level as the claim. Says, "Hey, you never defined the things that claim created. Therefore, I'm going to delete it." Uh, and the only way to avoid it. Is to is to prevent Argo CD from truncating things, uh, which is on the long run uh, creates other problems. So basically, uh, I think it's mostly the the problem of hierarchy. Uh, Argo CD will delete everything that is not uh, directly specified uh, 
uh, in Argo CD application or a child of that something? Oh, so I have seen situations where a you know resource, uh, we'll call it a meta resource, is created, and that's defined in your in your Helm chart, and Argo creates the meta resource, and then that meta resource tells a controller to create you know a, a some some sort of sub resource, and yeah. If the sub resource is created with the same annotations as the parent meta resource, then Argo is what, what happens is Argo believes that it created that resource and that that resource is no longer defined and therefore Correct. that it should delete it. And the pattern, and this is, I've seen this pattern with a couple of other controllers and it, my argument is this isn't the right pattern. I haven't, I haven't gotten this far in testing with Crossplane, so I don't know if Crossplane is doing this, but is that the child resources should not automatically have the annotations from the parent resources. Like you don't, that is not specifically like a design that I would, I, that, that I would sort of follow. But I believe Argo is also working on fixing this um, by introducing a different, it's like a different annotation. Um, and it, it depends, right? Like I can't remember the controller I saw, but I, I saw what ran into this problem recently where a controller specifically was using, you know, the Kubernetes.io slash app or app.kubernetes.io slash instance, what the really common um, sort of he, like Helm specific um, annotations or labels. Um, and it was copying those to all the child resources it created. Um, and that caused this exact problem. So um, I'm happy to, I'm, I'm going to be very close to testing this soon. And so I can, I can maybe see if I can reproduce that. Um, but I think that there, I think that there, if that's the problem, it's, it's a pretty easy fix um, to get around it. Yeah. Oh, that's I, good to hear. I'm going to raise, so I, I went to go add something to the board and there's actually like four different issues I, that, that we need to do some clean up. So um, I think there are at least two different actual issues, the status and the uh, child resource uh, reaping. Um, there may be more, but I'll, I'll add sort of a parent issue that just tracks that we want everything to work nicely with Argo CD because a lot of our community overlaps with Argo CD. Um, I think that's something that is going to be interested in this one, uh, especially the status stuff, for example, is um, whoever takes this and works on this shouldn't necessarily be looking at it as uh, how can we adapt cross-play to, to play nice with Argo CD. We should be looking at both projects and making sure that we can make them work well together. You know, as Argo pointed out, as, I, <laughs> uh, as Victor pointed out, um, Mr. Argo CD, um, if we were to just go and not change Argo CD at all and wanted to work with cross-play managed resources, it seems like we would need to go and customize Argo CD to know about literally every cross-play resource in the world, which is thousands of growing. So I think the status thing, for example, is going to have to be a fix in Argo CD for it to be any more an improvement in Argo CD for it to be sustainable in any way, based on what I've read. My understanding on this, right, is just that Argo ships with a bunch of default um, rules for resources, uh, cert manager, other common resources that clusters have, um, where it can sort of say, if this string equals this, then we're happy um, in the status. So as long as cross-plane resources have a standard mechanism for um, saying they're healthy, it should be reasonably easy to do that. That would be my suggestion as well, especially since if you do something like that, then we would be solving problem, instead of solving problem in Argo CD, we would be solving potentially problem in Argo CD Flux, Rancher Fleet or whatever else, yeah. Um, I mean, with, with like two exceptions, we do have a standard way of saying we're having that, uh, ready already. So for 998 okay. of our thousand custom resources, uh, they have a status condition called ready. And if ready becomes true, then it's ready. Um, so it's kind of surprising to me that, that that seems to be like a pretty normal pattern. That's the case status thing that Flux is, is looking after. So, uh, All right. I was, I was I'll, thinking, I'll, I'll I was be thinking, testing it soon. So, uh, Maybe I'll I'll go find that issue when I'm done when I'm when I get to that point and I'll update with whatever my findings are. Yeah, Vic, Victor's Victor's you, you had a comment on on the status issue. It, it seemed to be implying that like we would have to go in for each type, like specifically tell it for RDS instance, look for yeah. ready, S three, so, look for ready, etc. Th that's correct. The, what I'm not sure is 
uh, I did not check yet what are the uh, what was previously mentioned. What are the uh, stand, what are the default statuses or fields that it is looking uh, Argo CD is looking at, right? Uh, now, whatever are those fields that it is looking at the values, we are not using the same, no matter who is standard, no standard and stuff like that. And then assuming that we don't change anything on Argo C on the crossplane side, we would need to instruct uh, uh, Argo, C uh, Argo CD to do those things. Like the typical example would be deployment, right? Argo CD has special rules that say, hey, is the number of uh, pods running the same as the number of pods uh, that were specified in the replicas field or something like that, right? So it has special rules uh, for certain resources, which would be a nightmare. I don't think that we could ever do that, right? Uh, so we either modify Argo CD to say, hey, look for this, include this field with this value as the default for potentially all resources. Yeah, that, which would be whatever our status ready or whatever we have, right? Yeah, uh, that's, or that's to see what those rules are already and see whether we can adapt crosspoint to to have that field. I, I, I don't know what's yeah. easier, what's better. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. Unless unless what Argo CD's rules are at the moment is like an industry standard, I'm not super keen on it. We we can we can table this. Um, there is a standard yeah. for this. Flux follows the standard. We follow the standard. I think the correct way is to get Argo CD to follow the standard. To be fair, it is a new and nascent standard, so I can see that they might be reluctant, but we should at least have a conversation. They seem to be friendly folks. Yeah, yeah it, and it seems, yeah, it seems like, uh, yeah, we are, we don't have all the information we have right now here. And then Matt, thanks a lot for uh, contributing to the conversation here and, you know, taking things out for test spin and any of the observations that you find and sharing will, will be probably pretty helpful here also. So in general, for like speaking of the roadmap, there is a uh, you know high level theme here of you know working appropriately or uh, effectively with uh, GitOps you know CI/CD systems uh, like like Argo and both Flux also. Um, it seems like a high level roadmap sort of thing for that um, to to work well in those situations is is probably a good priority for the community overall. Yeah, I'm going to keep it scoped at Argo CD for now. Uh, I don't. I mean, I know there's really just the big two, but um, let's let's tackle Argo CD. That's the one we hear all the time. I haven't heard too many people complain that Flux doesn't work uh, with us. Uh, we can move on to that next. So it, it, a, well, I'm, I'm hesitant to have a catch-all issue that's just like crossplay works with every other GitOps tool ever. <laughs> in the meantime, does this mean that we can develop a patch set that would copy the annotations needed to fix that claim issue Victor had brought up? So that we just we can go ahead and advise people who are using Argo CD that if they use the, this patch set, the correct annotations and labels will get copied down to their claimed generated resources. I don't understand the problem. I'll have to weigh in on that. Yeah, and I think I think we have to uh, yeah understand kind of the exact root cause here and the right solution here that we can you know we'll probably design outside of this meeting here. Um, but yeah, so let's uh, so let's keep moving with roadmap uh, though and get through that so we can move to the next community this uh, topic section also. Dan, you said that you had an item for roadmap that you wanted to bring up too. Yeah, and I apologize for not getting the issue created before this, um, and I should have the PR open as, as soon as the issue exists as well. Um, but uh, I've been working on uh, formally defining the spec for uh, the X package format, which is the, the on disk format that we use for, for crosswind packages. Um, that is kind of a superset of requirements for OCI images. Um, so I just want to mention that was something that's going to be uh, a priority for 1.7. Um, and, and I'll make sure to get an issue uh, tracking that. Uh, it should be, uh, I think I think there'll be some changes coming. Uh, there's actually a, a new feature in 1.6 um, that's related to this, um, but everything is, uh, at least now the intention is for everything to continue to be backwards compatible, but uh, it should make building providers and that sort of thing uh, a bit easier. So just wanted to bring that to folks' attention, especially if you're interested in consuming or building tooling around packages. Awesome, Dan. Thanks for that update there, and uh, yeah, it, yeah, definitely do add it to the roadmap here um, when when you're able to. Cool. All right. Uh, any before we move on then uh, to providers uh, updates there. Any other comments to make on crossplane roadmap, crossplane future 2022 priorities?
All righty, cool. So let's uh, let's head on down on into the uh, updates on uh, provider related stuff. We've been talking about core cross plane, so let's move on to providers as well. Um, Muafik uh, pr provided some status here before the meeting into the agenda, and he isn't able to make it today. So we can talk through some of those uh, real quick then. So in terms of the effort uh, we've been working on uh, around uh, our Terajet based providers, um, there's a couple new ones there that uh, to uh, announce that haven't been mentioned before. So we're starting to see some more community adoption and being able to generate entire providers at once. Uh, so we have a new Linode one and an Exascale one also that are linked here in the agenda document if you want to check those uh, check those out. Um, the uh, it, it seems like with that pattern there, we've got a, you know a document and a guide about how to generate your own providers. Uh, so it seems like they're getting some interesting adoption there, and I'm hoping to see more of uh, more of this opportunity continue to be taken advantage of. So that's that's pretty exciting. Um, there is a, a new set of releases for Terajet providers, uh, base providers coming out uh, tomorrow, I guess. So the end of week here. Um, now, I, I don't know the details of this uh, note here, but it may be it's self-explanatory. So we are doing some effort to kind of, you know, there's still an alpha preview uh, sort of maturity here. And so we're doing some effort to get all of the uh, groupings of the resources into a more final state so that there will not be breaking changes later on. So there will, it sounds like right now during these preview stages, we'll still have a few breaking changes, moving things around, refactoring, et cetera and um, putting them up into a state to be uh, to be mature and uh, have, have not, not have breaking changes into the future. Uh, yesterday, there were two releases uh, for the uh, AWS provider and Azure provider. Uh, the 0.22 uh, provider AWS release was uh, kind of a, a bigger one, I guess, uh, bigger than the patch release for Azure. Um, so the release notes are here and encouraging folks to take a look at them. Um, you know, there's some, uh, some new resources that are supported, uh, some, several resources uh, in this list here moved from alpha to beta maturity also. So a lot of progress in, in AWS uh, and folks on this call here too, specifically uh, to contributing to that. So thank you everybody for that. Um, so do read through the release uh, resources, uh, sorry, the release notes here for 0.22.0 and that is available as of yesterday. All right, uh, so let's see, Aaron, uh, Christopher, uh, folks that are in AWS a lot, um, any any notes that you want to add or status you want to go ahead and share here for a provider AWS? I think the biggest enhancement for us, and I know also a lot of for Accenture, Deutsche Bahn and so on is um, our enhancement for Assume role arms that we can use, um, for example, injected identity, user roles, and assume roles in other AWS accounts, um, then the good point is that we get rid of um, using static credentials in the providers. So this was the biggest enhancement from our side, I think. And the rest is special thanks to Aaron and, and co um, for uh, updating the uh, code generator that we are now able to generate more resources with the code generator, for example, in EC2 area and so on. I don't know if Aaron had something more. No, I'm really excited about um, being able to, to start using the, the IAM roles and, and the cluster-based uh, authentication. Um, and the only other thing with, for me was the big one was finally getting onto the latest version of the AWS code gen and getting on the latest ACK generator um, and getting past that block so that we could start uh, merging more quickly now that the generation is not broken. Yeah, I, I wanted to add just onto that, that Christopher did an incredible job on the uh, I am role stuff. And that's a feature that folks have been wanting for a long time. If you look at the issues in the PR, I think there's, you know, tons of thumbs up and hearts on it. Uh, this is a hugely requested feature, uh, really, really high impact. Um, so the, the impact there cannot be overstated. Definitely really appreciate that work you did, Christopher. Thanks. And also we get the first enhancement to use more and more for Zoom roles and external identities and so on. So I think it unblocks a lot of. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. I definitely think that's a good improvement there. 
Yeah, and then uh, yeah, Aaron, I second that too for the effort on you know getting the ACK uh, uh, gen code generation updated. So we, we're moving faster now, and hopefully we have some things in place, or at least there's a good understanding of uh, you know being able to avoid um, you know regressions and crossplane related functionality in upstream ACK now as well. All right, uh, Alper, do you want to quickly give us an update about uh, the 0 0.18.1 uh, release from yesterday and the issue you fixed there? Yeah, sure. So it's a you know bug fix release, no API changes, no behavior changes. Uh, you know, as you know, we had an issue in provider Azure while provisioning AKS clusters. We were getting uh, validation errors for the FID URI that we specify for the uh, you know, graph RBAC application that we are provisioning. Uh, you know, this fixes that issue. And also, um, after fixing this, this issue, uh, we had observed a sporadic regarding the credentials that we use for the application. Uh, you know, as we reconcile, we generate new password. Uh, if we need to reconcile more than once, it means that we can generate multiple passwords for the same application. Although we update the application uh, due to some race conditions on the Azure side, uh, at some point we could get clusters uh, where the credentials that we are that the cluster is using uh, the application credential that the cluster is using does not match the actual applications credentials so uh, we had uh, at some point uh, experienced similar issues with the postgresql server also uh, on the azure side uh, so we applied a similar fix here uh, yeah so this is for it yeah, nice. And uh, I know a number of people that had run into that. So thank you for getting that uh, fix in there and then released yesterday also out there. That's fantastic. Thank you. All right. Uh, cool. And then Hassan, a uh, quick update on GCP also. Hassan, are you uh, are you there for a, a GCP update? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sweet. Yeah, thank you. sorry. I, I messed up multiple monitors. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, basically there are not too many updates uh, and too many activity in provider GCP. Like there are a couple of like open PRs that got reviewed and waiting for reviews, etc. But the only thing, the only change that we had from till uh, from the last uh, community meeting is that new resource, container registry resource added by Sergan as his first contribution. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, awesome. And then congratulations to Sergan uh, then for, uh, you know, you've done, made more contributions since then, uh, but congratulations on your first contribution, that is, and the first of many to come. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I hope. <laughs> I hope so also. <laughs> right on. Okay, great, great. So yeah, we can move ahead on to the um, community topics section now. Uh, I've got about 20 minutes left, so I think we're uh, maybe a little tight, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Uh, so a quick note is that uh, during the holiday uh, season here, we will be canceling the next uh, upcoming community meeting here. So we've got that already noted in the agenda. So December 30th, uh, we will not be meeting and we'll resume back in the new year together. So hopefully everybody has a great holiday season, gets to recharge and uh, you know spend time doing the things that are important to them. Uh, okay, cool. So we've got a lot of good links in here for uh, content uh, related to Crossplane over the last couple of weeks. Um, of particular note, I think uh, Victor put out a pretty cool video uh, of the old chicken and the egg problem about having a uh, you know a management cluster and for your crossplane and, and where do you, where does that how do you create that one to begin with? So uh, definitely a cool resource there. Um, Nick had written up a really really interesting write up on uh, you know things we're doing at, at uh, Upbound and uh, around creating a using GraphQL to create a graph of resources on top of uh, of Crossplane and uh, you know being able to expose higher level concepts uh, for APIs and experiences built on top of it. So that's a pretty cool article also. 
uh, Dan did a deep dive uh, onto composition that is, uh, you know, folks on this call might, might be familiar with some of that stuff, but uh, probably not everything that Dan went over there. So that was super useful also. Um, yeah, Ani, Anais keeps doing cool content. Uh, I, I love having her in the ecosystem and community. She keeps uh, writing some cool things and, and talking uh, and incorporating cross planes to the stuff that she's doing. So that's fantastic. And then Dan gave maybe uh, an unusual uh, talk. Uh, he went to the Risk Five Summit and uh, talked about um, you know cross plane related things and cloud provider related things uh, with uh, with Risk Five architecture too. So. Lots of cool stuff there. Links are all here available in the agenda doc if you want to catch up on those. And this continues to be one of my favorite sections of the community meeting, just to see all the cool stuff that we're doing and people in the community ecosystem talking about us and, and just kind of the project continuing to move forward. So I, I love this section here. Really cool stuff to talk about. Uh, okay, cool. Um, and then uh, I wanted to call attention to there's uh, what I thought was an interesting discussion on Slack uh, about uh, how you can, if you're a current Terraform user, how you can kind of slowly migrate over uh, instead of all in one quick shot, um, you know, start kind of moving some resources over in the available uh, paths we have in the in the crossman community for that. So do click on that and read that uh, through that if you want some ideas around uh, migrating from Terraform to Crossplane. Uh, I think Muafik added this particular uh, issue here. So it's a, a request for comment here. If uh, folks wanted to add their opinions uh, to this particular issue, I'm not up to speed on this issue. So maybe um, you know Nick or uh, Hassan or somebody else who's co commented on it can provide a quick high level summary to it. Uh, but this is a request for comment of folks that want to provide their opinion. This is the uh, the place to do that here on this issue. So I, I think this is really just a, a, a well, just it's it is an important thing, but it is a is a naming thing. Uh, currently, we make the distinction right. So um, we build providers a couple of different ways. They share a lot of the same libraries, uh, regardless. They're all sort of uh, based on the same underlying libraries. But the Jet providers. Uh, the ones that uh, provide a hyphen JET, hyphen AWS, for example, versus provide a hyphen AWS. The JET uh, signifies that they're built with TerraJet, which is uh, a code generation tool that will build a provider automatically wrapping a Terraform provider. Uh, we have thought we might, we, we say JET rather than like Terraform or whatever, because we think we might have other code generation tools in future. And the, the context is we have, a, we have a small handful of code generation tools that are all something JET, AgriJet, TerraJet, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the, slang for code generation. So right now we group everything separately. Um, we have a distinct provider AWS and a provider jet AWS. You can install both and you can mix and match them, um, but we, we keep them as separate packages. Uh, part of the argument for that in the past has effectively been because they're built differently and they work differently, particularly because the TerraGen one wrap Terraform and are actually forking a Terraform binary in the background to go and do the, what they what they need to do. They probably have different operational uh, characteristics than native providers. So native providers are calling an API uh, using like a you know a Go SDK, typically making REST calls. TerraJet providers uh, basically translate all the crossplane config into a Terraform config, fork Terraform, apply it, pass the output, and reflect that in the status of the resource. Um, we've hypothesized that there are different operational characteristics for this, right? Like uh, just the performance of forking a Terraform binary versus making a Go call uh, or a REST call via Go. Um, and uh, also like, you know, error handling, you know, it's possible we might like leak Terraform implementation details at some point. We hypothesize this. Wubuff tells me it doesn't actually happen that much. Um, you know, there's folks on the call who would know better than me. Uh, but anyway, where I think Wubuff is going with this is do we want to use this jet signifier when there isn't anything to compare it to? So if there's an existing provider AWS, we call the, the jet variant provider jet AWS. If we just started provider foobar tomorrow and we use Terra jet to, to create it and there was no provider foobar, would we call it provider jet foobar or would we just call it provider foobar because it was the only one? So I think that's kind of the, the main thing that, uh, that Uvoff is, is sort of suggesting here. Does that make sense? Yes, that does make sense, Nick. Uh, and thank you for sharing that context. Uh, so yeah, so this issue here, once uh, 169, is linked in the agenda document. And uh, if folks want to provide a comment there, then please do that in the GitHub issue so it's uh, captured all in one place there. 
All right. Um, so Dan, you mentioned this uh, PR here, I think. Yep. Uh, so this is a, a very small PR uh, in terms of what the actual change is, um, but it potentially has, has some larger impact. Um, so essentially what this does is if you've ever authored um, a provider, uh, you're probably familiar with that crossplane.yaml that has uh, the provider meta package type in there that defines uh, what controller image should be used to reconcile all the CRDs um, that you're installing. Uh, all this does is it makes that field optional. So previously, if you uh, omitted that field from the spec of your provider uh, meta uh, uh, crossplane.yaml, it would uh, fail to build and crossplane would fail to install it. Um, that was by design. We needed that controller image. Uh, now that is optional. And uh, if it's not provided, we'll actually use the same image uh, that the package is uh, to start the controller as well which gives you the ability to um, kind of do this pattern that I think we're, we're moving towards and could potentially simplify um, some of our provider uh, building uh, called fat packages, if you will, where you essentially have um, everything for the uh, controller, uh, including, you know, the binary and any kind of runtime stuff uh, you need in there. Um, and, uh, and then you also have the package contents. Uh, the, the obvious kind of trade-off with this is that uh, when Crossplane caches that package image, uh, it's going to be a lot larger than it was with just the YAML because um, it's got the binary in there and any other things you need. Um, and so this is kind of the first step uh, to give us the ability to kind of try out this pattern and see how folks like it. Um, and you do, you'll see in the testing here, notice that you have to bump the, the cache size because the, the image is, is quite a bit larger. Um, in the future, what we'll likely do, and this is part of the, the spec uh, that I was mentioning earlier uh, that, that um, I'll be adding to the docs, uh, is we'll only cache the package image contents, even if the uh, image is much larger. Uh, there's a variety of ways we'll support doing that uh, via OCI image annotations and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so you should be able to have a single image um, and not have to increase your cache size uh, basically at all. So anyway, this is the, the first step towards this. Definitely feel free to try this out uh, if you like. Um, it could be as simple as taking your provider controller image and uh, just if you're building with Docker, do an add package.yaml into it um, and that'll work for you. Um, so yeah, this this is in 1.6 or will be in 1.6 and then in 1.7, uh, we'll follow up with uh, some changes in, in how we do caching and that sort of thing. Awesome, Dan. Yeah, thanks for sharing that uh, and, and the further context around that. Okay, and uh, uh, Alper, I think you kind of touched on the sporadic issues with AKS cluster provisioning already when you're talking about the 18.1 release. Uh, is there any more that you wanted to add on top of that or any, any further context? Yeah, so uh, there's quite a deep discussion in the issue referenced, so I don't want to go into you know, too much details of it, but uh, it looks like, you know, the way we provision AKS clusters is prone to, uh, you know, certain uh, race conditions on the Azure side. Uh, I have, uh, you know, uh, documented my findings in the issue for interested readers. So it looks like that, uh, you know, we need to have some behavioral changes as we uh, discussed uh, and uh, probably, you know, uh, we will have, we have right now new mechanisms for provisioning AKS clusters. Uh, so I think we will need to employ those mechanisms with the upcoming versions of Provider Azure. I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, uh, have attention here that uh, you may we may need, uh, hit some further products uh, that I observed for the first time when trying uh, the zero point eighteen point one release. So while validating it. Yeah, thank you for calling those out, Alper, and providing the you know details about the behavior you were seeing and um, you know the like, potential workarounds and ways to avoid it and uh, you know how it could be 
a inconsistency issue that which active reconciliation and visual consistency can eventually solve too. So it's good to know all that sort of stuff. Thanks for writing that up. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, cool. And then I think Stephen added a note here, uh, which is useful to everybody here, is that the uh, call for proposals, the CFP for uh, KubeCon, next KubeCon in, in the EU, is uh, the deadline is tomorrow. So if you're uh, thinking about getting a talk in, uh, you, need, you need to be able to do that uh, by tomorrow. I think it's probably midnight tomorrow is how they normally do it. Um, if you want any feedback or, uh, you know, um, commentary on any CFPs you're working on, uh, feel free to share them with the community and uh, we're all happy to provide any sort of guidance or uh, potential feedback to improve them. So uh, that deadline is tomorrow, be aware of that. And um, that sounds like a fun one too, because I believe it's in Valencia uh, in Spain. So that would uh, be pretty cool to be a speaker and, and go to that one. Uh, sweet, all right. I don't see anything else on the agenda here. Yeah. Jared just calling out Matt just uh, said in chat that he had some topics he'd like to bring up. Oh, sweet. Yes. All right. Then this is the uh, the time for those topics to come on up, Matt. Perfect. Thank you. I didn't want to add them into the agenda um, if it wasn't the right place. Uh, so I, I, they're, they're questions, but they're questions that I see um, lots of references to, and I haven't seen any specific um, like documented answers like uh, of the pattern that should be followed. And I'm, I get the impression maybe there isn't a pattern yet. And that's why I wanted to, I wanted to ask about that in terms of forward thinking here. Um, the first one is <clears throat> when we start thinking about uh, creating, you know, giving our developers or our users the ability to create cloud resources, right? Uh, S3 buckets, KMS keys, et cetera. Um, you know, there's this question of, okay, I can create the bucket, but then how do I use the bucket? How do I access it, right? Well, I need an IAM role, let's say, and this is of course Amazon specific, but I imagine GCP and, and Azure have similar pattern. Um, and there's this, there's basically a big question of, is the, is the developer required to create an IAM role where they're granting themselves a privilege to talk to a bucket based on a name that they expect? Or are we creating a bucket and creating a policy that's attached to that bucket that knows the name of the IAM role that it's going to grant in, right? Like, where is the source of truth here? And I, you know, I find in, in, in either case, in either sort of world, um, whether you do it on the IAM role or on the bucket, there be, there's this like disconnect and, and big area where you're going to, where you can make mistakes, right? You might not know your IAM role name because maybe that's programmatically created, probably is. Um, you may not know the bucket name because maybe that's, you know, what you enter in as a bucket name is then mutated and additional fields or data are added to it. It seems to me like I'm missing, either I'm missing a pattern, which may be the case, or the composition framework is maybe missing some functionality for me to be able to go outside of that, in that single composition and gather a piece of data from somewhere else, like getting an annotation off of a service account for the EKS role or or going to just some specific object and getting a field from that specific object. And I was curious at that, like, are there more discussions happening on how to you know improve the composition framework so that you can sort of insert data from external places or um, or am I missing something and, and it's just it's well documented and I I completely missed this as I dug through things. There are uh, multiple, yeah, the, the composition functionality is not done. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, we're, we're an open source project. There is there is definitely infinite amount of improvement to be to be done to it. Um, your specific use case, I, I don't know if I really want to dig into it uh, in the time we have left, but what you just mentioned sounds like something that could be done with composition today. Uh, I would have I would have thought that you could create the IAM roles as part alongside the bucket in an opinionated fashion uh, without giving developers too much control over you know they would theoretically be tri triggering the creation, but then this wouldn't necessarily have to have like you know full control over over all the permissions it gets and things like that. But I, I, I think the challenge, I think I agree. I don't want to solve this specific problem, right? I'm using this this problem as an example, but I think the challenge is, yeah, I could create a composition that also creates an IAM role. But then that's a very like that's a very specific role 
that has to be used to get into that bucket. And now what if the person has a bucket and a KMS key, right? And those are two different, totally different resources. Do we create a role for the KMS key that's separate from the role for the bucket? And then the developer has to assume into those roles. Like this, this it, basically it feels like compositions right now can reference a bunch of other components within that composition, but that I don't have a method for referencing data from outside of the composition. Um, and so I, I feel like my current answer is going to be that they, you know, developers have to create their own IAM policies and then use sort of loosely wild carded resource names in their policies, which we don't like um, in order to solve it. So I'm happy to open a GitHub issue if there isn't like a really, you know, where this could be discussed more, that's fine. Yeah, um, or, I mean, or if there's another forum where we can discuss this problem. I don't yeah, want to. I, uh, the, specific, the specific issue of, um, you want to compose uh, using data that is not part of the composition uh, is uh, already exists. I can, uh, are you on uh, okay. Slack? I don't know if I can find it uh, in time, but I can definitely uh, uh, find a reference to it. Yeah, I, I'm on Slack, uh, deranged, spelled with an I. Cool, I will uh, um, find that for you. There's, there's a couple of things, right? There's one is adding functionality for observer only resources, which in the Terraform world is like a data source effectively, uh, which would allow you to say, okay, this IAM role uh, exists uh, and I want to refer to it, um, but I want to declaratively manage it necessarily. Uh, and the other one is whether or not you have an observe only uh, resource. Um, but yeah, sometimes you might want to just pull in some data from a config map or something outside of crossplay and then use that yeah. as part of your composition. Um, and then this is all wrapped up in this idea, uh, uh, not, not necessarily part of the same functionality, but then the, the question we always ask ourselves with, with composition as it exists today is, how far do we want to go with that before we just invest in custom composition and say it's too complicated? Like let's let's you know build this into uh, uh, the custom composition idea that allows you to just go use Python or the uh, TypeScript or whatever and actually just like start describing all of this in a, in a, in a high level language. I'm not necessarily saying we will solve that that way. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that. Uh, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these ideas, like we were always sort of doing the trade off of like the idea of composition originally as it stands today, was it was supposed to solve very simple use cases. Composition as it exists today is not supposed to be like feature compatible with Terraform, let's say, uh, uh, modules. So, it, it, uh, you know, if we, if we can grow it to be feature compatible with Terraform modules in a way that like feels elegant, it doesn't make people like scream in horror when they open it up and be like, oh my God, it's millions of lines of yaml then that would be amazing and totally do that but uh but yeah these are all things that we're we're looking to so if uh, you can see on the roadmap the observe only resources one is there and i it's possible that the um i'm not actually sure whether the the data sources one is on the the roadmap that okay. you can stuff from other data sources but uh, if not i'll find it all right well it I certainly have... sounds like oh go ahead I would just ask, like you know, like you can provide input to com to your composition with with the parameters in claims or XRDs. So I'm just trying to make sure that you are aware of that, so that like for example, you can just get the name of the like IAM user as an input to your composition simply in the like spec of your claim. So this is already there, and uh, maybe this this is this could already solve the problem. So, so, what would, so I can also add something. What we did at the moment is also to create this um, provider Kubernetes, the uh, service accounts in the tenant namespace and label or annotate the service account with the correct uh, IAM role we created in the compositions. And then the tenants can configure uh, the service account uh, in their Helm charts, for example then we exactly know that, uh, that the service account they created uh, has the correct uh, set it up role or policy for them. And um, our point of view is if a tenant creates, for example, a three bucket, then the tenant is also, um, yeah, they, they, they need to thought about what they uh, configure in the, in the policies and so on, yeah? So um, we did at the, at the end a day through operation that the security, guys uh, will tell them that the uh, uh, IAM roles and so on are not correctly configured. Yeah. And then they need to do something, uh, for example, in 24 hours or 48 hours uh, to fix the issues then, because we as um, uh, administrators of the clusters are not able to validate all of the stuff they did. 
in our clusters? Yeah, I think that latter answer is, um, well, actually both of those are, are sort of accurate answers in terms of a way you can get around this. I think they both introduce the thing that I'm trying to prevent, which is user error, um, you know, and users needing to be aware of, okay, if I create my IAM role resource, I now need to know the pattern that that is going to create for the actual name of the IAM role in Amazon. And then I need to sort of copy that around, which just when, when you run lots of clusters and we ask our, you know, our users deploy to eight or 10 clusters around the world, it just adds a lot of opportunity for them to make mistakes. But it also sounded like you guys are looking at this sort of in the, in the cross plane composition um, uh, space. And, and I feel like it's not a, it's not a far fetched answer to introduce the ability to go and, and sort of have a user pass in a reference to another object to get their IAM role or, or any other piece of data. Like, I think you guys are thinking about it, which is great. I do want to find that issue and maybe thumbs up it, you know, or, or uh, you know, and, and I'm in the, in the short term, we can of course do that. Um, you know, we'll, I think the answer is going to be passing in the IAM role name um, and we'll just deal with it from there. Is this not uh, solved by the right connection secret to ref part of the so composition? Well, it's sort of the opposite, but like, let's say you had, let's say you created a composition to create an IAM role. Okay. And then mm -hmm. you write the secret, you, you write out a secret at the end that, uh, mm -hmm. that has the name of the, the, a, the full ARN of that role. Yeah. Now I create a composition that allows them to create a bucket. Well, my current understanding is they would have to go and manually get the role out of the secret and then manually pass that value in to the cust to the resource definition for their bucket. There's no way that I know of to make the bucket get the value from, for example, the secret. It depends, I think, on whether if you pass in the name from that secret into your composition, it would depend on whether the resource, such as the bucket or the policy, supports a secret ref as a source for its data. For any resource that does support a secret reference instead of the explicit value, yeah, you can you can simply say, here's the name of the secret that from that, that was written by my composition to create an IAM role. And I want you to source your values from that secret. But I don't think we serve, yeah, as everybody has pointed out, we're working on what that looks like if you try to surface that up to where any key in a composition can source a secret reference. Yeah, I, th I think that latter part is kind of what you what you ultimately need to be able to tie resources together um, and sort of allow, you know, it's allowing the service catalog approach, right? Rather than, rather than an administrator who understands a composition and understands, I know their IAM role is gonna look like this. So then I'll create their bucket and I'll pass in this value because I know that those two will look together. Trying to trying to have, you know make it simple enough that a developer can just say I, I have a role, I need a bucket, I'm done. Right? It, they're they're connected. Um, I don't want to I don't want to drag this on too long. I, I um, but I but I very much appreciate the conversation um, and that you guys are kind of looking at it. And we'll you know we'll go with this the stupid simple answer for now, and um, we're just passing that value in, um, I, I, and then we'll, I, uh... we'll adjust it in the future. I, I dropped the two issues that I think are relevant, or at least two of them, in chat here uh, in, the, in the Zoom chat. So definitely grab those before the poll oh. ends. I'll put those into um, the agenda doc here. I uh, also said that they're more persisted. Right. And uh, I, I I think given the, all of this conversation, um, it's it's worth either opening a discussion on GitHub or opening an issue on GitHub that goes into more detail about what your use cases are, what you consider the solutions, and like what you'd like to see instead. That way we can make sure that, you know, we at least have those use cases when we look at these issues. Yeah, I would, I'm, I'm always happy to do this in um, in a GitHub discussion. I always find that that gets makes it easier to get other you know outside opinions and and um, make sure that we're not we're not way off the wall or crazy in, in what you know what we're hoping to do. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I, I know that the observe only resources is uh, uh, likely to be a priority uh, sometime soon. At least we. Have, <laughs> we are not bound to um, uh, hear from our customers that that is something that we want to work. Okay. Um, I had one other question, um, and I think this is still somewhat generic, but my, my example will be not, um, which was, and, and I've seen this come up a few times, It's ba and someone actually posted about it in the chat literally this morning. Um, basically, 
trying to control the templatized name of the resources that are created in, in the cloud, um, you know, by your provider. But right now, it seems that there is a you know there's a way to explicitly control the entire name, and there's a way to let the composition controller dynamically generate a name. Um, but there isn't kind of a middle ground where you can control the pattern. Um, for example, you know, I want to prefix all my resources created by cluster A with cluster A dash, whatever that, you know, whatever your pattern might be. Um, and, you know, the question that somebody asked this morning was like, is there a pattern for being able to use generate name in your, uh, in the, in the resources that are being created by the composition? Um, I was thinking about it a different way, which was, you know, you've got combined from composite, you know, you have from field path as an example, as, as a, you know, one variable form, you could, I, I was thinking you could have another one where it's like generate a UUID or something, right? Where you could have like, you know, you can comp compose your external name the way you really want to. But, uh, but I was just curious if there's an ongoing discussion about this. Um, right now, I feel like it's, it's I, we have to control the name entirely and, put, you know, deal with conflicts or we don't control the name at all. And that actually makes the first issue I brought up more complicated when you don't control the name at all. Um, I would I would raise an issue to discuss this. Uh, it's It should be possible to some extent already, right? Because you can patch to the external name and you can use transforms and string formats and things like that to templatize that patch. Um, but, you know, uh, we have had like a random string generator function proposed, but it's actually kind of hard to build. Um, surprisingly, it sounds easy. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, uh, so I can I, I can open up an issue on that. Uh, that that's no problem. Yeah, I, just as a data point on that one, that that to, as far as I know, this is like the second time it's ever come up. So I, I agree that it's a thing we should fix, but it's not something that we're seeing like the community clamoring to to, to get done. I, I find that like certain big orgs who have existing policies around like how stuff should be named already at this, and there's only two or three folks who've come to us with that so far. But uh, definitely yeah, throw that one at an issue um, and I'll try and remember to, uh, I'll comment on it and, and with some of the like, functionality that is possible today um, with regards to templating the external name. And, and I think there is more to be added to that as well. Yeah, that maybe there's a temp, maybe there's a pattern that that'll work well enough for us. So um, I'll open up an issue. Appreciate it. Thank you. And awesome. Matt, those and, are my two issues. Yeah, this is some really good critical thinking too and good feedback uh, about patterns and you know how best to enable scenarios that are important to you and, and by extension like more of the community also. So this is this is a really good discussion today, Matt. I really appreciate that, man. Yeah. All Thanks right. Thanks for having me. Alrighty, everybody. So let's go ahead and wrap it here uh, then. Um, so thanks everybody for joining. A great discussions today uh, and happy 2021. And we will reconvene in 2022. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye.